What is up, everybody? Welcome into your Network 216 Daily Exclusive for Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022. This one's going to be a little bit longer than our normal daily shorts. Um, I wanted to take the time to bring in uh, Blake Weiner. He's been on the show before um, to discuss the – not necessarily discuss the Deshaun Watson suspension, but we're going to discuss the document that doc, uh, Judge Sue Robinson – like, what would you call? What is it? A finding, a legal? Doc, like, what? What would the document be called? I don't want to. I would, miss. I would call it a uh, mem memorandum opinion and finding. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So I just did a really weird intro to the show, but we're just gonna get right into this. So, <laughs> but we're going to break down the uh, fifteen-page document with her findings and kind of talk about it from all that standpoint. And then we'll kind of do some main takeaways here, here at the end. But um, uh, Blake and I talked beforehand and we kind of want to go, I've highlighted a bunch of key points. I've told him if I skip any of his key points to, to go back through it. So I'm going to read some expert excerpts from the uh, document and then kind of Blake and I will kind of just kind of, you know, bounce it off uh, uh, this situation. Uh, Blake, I'm sorry. Could you, I, I didn't give you this opportunity, but could you give your, your legal credentials just for reference for people that are curious? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so I graduated law school from Georgetown Law in 2018. Um, for the year after law school, I clerked in the United States District Court in the um, Southern District of West Virginia. And so actually that experience is, is pretty funny here because Sue Robinson's a former federal district court judge. So when people talk about, you know, what she's thinking, what she's doing, how she's writing, whether she's writing it, I have pretty good insight into what's going on there because I had a judge just like that. And then after my uh, federal clerkship, I worked at the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. Um, I was the assistant U.S. attorney first for about a year and a half in the criminal side and then for about a year in the civil division doing uh, defense work. I defended the United States in civil lawsuits. And then uh, just actually a couple months ago, I started my own uh, law practice in Richmond, Virginia, where I basically practice uh, criminal defense and police misconduct. That's really that's really awesome, man. I, you know, um Congratulations. You know, I know, I think that's the best way to do it. Right. You know, I just, I think you, that's really awesome. Um, I, you know, you say you're down there in Richmond. I, uh, I went to, um, AIT when I was in the army down in Fort Lee, which is, um, oh, okay. not too far from there. And so I do know that your summers are miserably humid. So, yeah, it's uh, I mean, it's basically like, I don't like Florida, I guess, but not not as humid. But it, it's it's pretty brutal, yeah. That's where I was in. I was in Fort Lee in the summer, and it was just like our rooms did not have air conditioning. It was a, oh it was it was a it was a miserable time. But not it's the legal. army. Not legal. It, uh, well, the, technically, I don't know. Well, you know what? There's a lot of different laws for the for the military, right? Because like, t technically. Technically, adultery is illegal in the army. Like, for example, oh, like is it? yeah. See, I don't see. I, yeah. Like I was telling you before, I don't have all the answers. I don't know. Yeah, I always thought that was funny, but that's just what they always warned us. I'm sorry, we're off track. All right, guys. So we're gonna get into the document. I'm gonna start here. The first point. Um, I'm really not gonna start here till towards the back end of page two, because kind of when you read the beginning, if you guys want to go back, uh, ESPN and a bunch of other places have published this document, so you can see it. But like the first page and a half is really just talking about what the CBA is, um, what the policy, like the word for word, what the um, conduct policy is when it talks about the ways that you can violate it and some things like that. But uh, Judge Robinson will later as I've highlighted, talk about the three parts that actually matter are applicable to this case. So I'm kind of going to skip over that. So the first thing that I kind of put on here that I thought was really interesting, these two little quotes, uh, she said that the disciplinary officer, which in this case is her, so talking about it being jointly appointed, uh, is responsible for conducting uh, evidentiary hearings, issuing binding findings of fact, and determining the discipline that should be imposed, if any, in accordance with the policy, though both, uh, but though the determination is subject to the right of either party to appeal to the commissioner. So I think that what's interesting here is we talk about, is there going to be an appeal? 
does it kind of sound like even though you do have the right to appeal to me and maybe I misunderstand this is I read that kind of like they don't think you should appeal when they agreed on it because it's a binding finding. Am I, am I out of base on this or, or, or where do you line up with that? Yeah, I don't read that into it. In fact, I, and we can talk about this at the very end because she says something at the very end that actually leads me to the opposite conclusion. Uh, but well, this sentence here, no, I just read that as, as her saying that I give the determination, but that determination is contingent on the idea that they can appeal. Okay. Yeah. See, and that's why, and that's, yeah, I was totally, I totally see what you're, what you're saying there. Okay. So we're going to go to the record. This is the, the section just it's labeled the record. And I know Blake that you have some issues with some of the citations and grammar and punctuation on this documentation. I mean, she, there's, there's literally typos and I mean, I, I don't want to be an ass. There's we just typos. I mean, yeah. She has, other than the record, the headings in the remaining of the document, the NFL's investigation on page four, uh, my findings on page five, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They're all off center. Yeah. Um, again, I don't want to sound like an ass, but to me, that's like very sloppy. It just, it, 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 it you know, and the only reason I even brought this up to you after seeing your tweet was just because it, the sloppiness of it based on how official this is supposed to be. Like Correct. you've brought in a former judge because she's Correct. supposed to be impartial. It's supposed to be essentially a legal proceeding without it having right. actual like criminal implications. Right. And let me add two things to that. And I, I completely agree. The first thought that I have is I'm always, I always recall a quote from Anthony Bourdain. He's that famous uh, restaurateur who committed suicide a few years ago as a really popular guy. He had a quote when talking about restaurants. He said, uh, if you want to know the quality of a restaurant, if you should trust it, go into the bathroom and look at what the bathroom looks like, because that's the part of the restaurant that they know you're going to see. So if you go into a bathroom and it looks like absolute trash, you have to tell yourself, if this is what they know I'm looking at, imagine what the areas of the restaurants that they know I'm not looking at look like, right? And that's the same exact thought I'm having looking at this. All we can tell from Sue Robinson's investigation is what she shows us. Mm -hmm. And if what she's showing us is just 15 pages, and in that 15 pages, it's got misplaced headings and typos with commas, that's what we're seeing. Imagine what we're not seeing. Imagine when she's by herself and nobody's looking how much effort maybe she's putting into it or lack thereof. The second point uh, that I wanted to make really quickly, like I said, I was a federal law clerk. I drafted judicial opinions. I drafted opinions for my district court judge. Uh, most of my opinions were like over 30 pages or so double this length. I, I, if, if one of my co-clerks called me and he said, hey, I was just reading an old opinion of yours. Did you know all of your headings were off center? I would be mortified. And that's with the understanding that nobody reads those opinions. I mean, they might be published on like Lexus or Westlaw for other lawyers. Yeah. Read. That's not going to get posted on ESPN, right? So the fact that this is posted on ESPN and all over the country, frankly, and it's this egregious to me, that, that says a lot. Yeah. You know, that's really interesting just because I – yeah, I mean, I just I hadn't really considered any of that until I saw you bring it up. I mean, I had seen the typos, you know what I mean? But it's just like, that's, yeah, that's a that's a really kind of little nugget to have in the back of your head kind of as you as you go through the rest of this. So I'm going to I'll go go real quick through the parts that I have highlighted in the record and we'll get to the actual investigation situation here. Um, one thing I do point out here when people talk about the stuff outside of these four cases and why they think that the six games should be higher, she says right out, out the rip, my decision is limited to the record presented to me. So that is just something, morally speaking, I understand why people are like, well, all of these other names. Well, but that's just not how this works. It's not how this proceeding works. She can only go off of what she has. So the NFL says that they're that the record that they have compiled that Watson violated three provisions of the policy. So that's important to where where we're going from here and that is one sexual assault, two conduct that poses a genuine danger to the safety and well-being of another person, and three conduct that undermines or puts the risk to puts oh my goodness, puts at risk the integrity of the NFL. It's, it's after 10 o'clock at night guys, I'm just saying. 
um, as we as we record this. So that keep that in mind as we as we kind of go through there. Um, is there anything anything that steps uh, jumps out to you from just from the records side point? Uh, so just based on everything that you said, the only thing that stuck out to me, and we talked about this briefly earlier, is that I, I just view this as it's just a sexual assault issue. The other two points were probably addressed because like all lawyers do in all proceedings, they throw out every possible avenue and they probably thought if we can't get a conviction on the sexual assault, maybe we can get a finding of fact on these other two prongs. Once you found for the sexual assault, I, I frankly view the other two findings as pretty meaningless. And I, and I think I, after you had brought that up, I, I agree. I mean, if you've if you've committed sexual assault, I'm not really worried about what else you've done. I'm worried about the fact that you have, you know, committed sexual assault. In terms of the minor things that he has alleged, I don't want to call them minor, but in terms of the other things, the important one is, hey, if you've proven sexual assault, we've got a situation that we need to deal with. Um, I will just point out real quick that the NFL's investigation was conducted by two former prosecutors with decades of relevant experience investigating sexual assault crimes because that was something i wondered i'm like you know like where did the nfl who did they you know how did they get their information that sort of thing so that's important to point out and also that it resulted in a 250 215 page investigative report which she will then refer to as the report the rest of the way and then it was then presented in the three-day um hearing okay so we'll get into the nfl's investigation uh, and then we go to uh, Judge Robinson's um, findings as we as we kind of where did I go here? Here we go. Um, okay. The NFL points out right out the gate that despite having access to team provided and approved massage therapists, Mr. Watson sought out private message massage it massage it massages. There we go. And according to the NFL, used his status as an NFL player as a pretext to engage in premeditated pattern of predatory behavior towards multiple women, which this is not new. That is what we knew. We knew that that is what the NFL was like, hey, this is what we're going to seek out. This is what we're going to go for. Well, actually, I should say Maybe not everybody knows that because I think some people are still under the impression that Deshaun Watson is alleged by multiple people to be a rapist. And I think a lot of people are still under the impression that Deshaun Watson is accused of, you know, violent sexual assault. So, I, you know, I, I think it's important to emphasize that really all we're looking at here is uh, these levels of sexual assault and not the, the level of rape. That is that. That is a, actually a really good point that you bring up because there is a situation on Twitter where if you say anything about the Browns, there's going to be someone out there that's going to call you pro-rape, which, listen, sexual assault, rape, anything of that nature, those are very serious accusations, crimes, and situations. Not to be taken lightly, not to be turned into fucking jokes on the internet. And, and it just, that's what I think this has become. And I didn't know I was going to get mad right out the rip, but I just like, I, you know what I mean? It just, it's, it is frustrating because just because you support a football team, I don't support Watson. I support the Browns. I do not support his behavior. Uh, it's funny you say that I got a, um, I, I have my, um, my law firm website linked to my Twitter page and I got a message through my law firm website through my like secure law firm portal mm -hmm. where somebody basically I'm looking for the message now. It looks like it got deleted. Uh, somebody said something like, ha ha ha. Uh, uh, yeah, I love to rape. Oh, it, it said the message was from Desha Deshaun. One. It was his name. <laughs> ha ha ha. I love to rape. You're great on Twitter. I love rapists or something like that. So, yeah. It's it, and it was like I put out and maybe I and maybe I was insensitive with this and 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 I shouldn't have done, said it. I put out a tweet that solely said that if the final decision is six games, that the Browns should be three and three and they should be a playoff team. I was just trying to go from the football side point standpoint. I didn't say I agreed with six games because after reading this, I don't. So yeah. you, you know, in things like that. It, I, but it, it turned into that thing. So it's just, it's, I, the world is, is a interesting place, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So they talk about it being a pattern of conduct. Um, they, she goes on the NFL's investigation. She writes on that goes on to say, Mr. Watson's requests were typically, because I think this is important. They were typically urgent wanting to schedule that massage the same day, which is, which I think is, 
it, it just shows how manic almost i think that the behavior may have been that it was like oh it needs you know i need this i need it now he was not looking for a professional setting and often inquired as to whether the massage would be private he admitted that he was not concerned whether the women were experienced or even licensed so i mean you're starting you're looking at and, and granted l listen i understand this is going to read as though it's definitive when it's just her characterizing the NFL's investigation right now. We're going to get into her findings and all of that stuff. So I understand that some people are going to argue here and there um, about, I don't know, that this is like dra dramatized or anything like that. I'm just reading what the NFL has put out, and then she's going to address it here shortly. It's interesting that th I actually was surprised. Were you, I want to ask your, you about this. There was, So there was four in this case that they are referring to there was four cases because the fifth one got thrown out only only three were licensed um on operating their own business the fourth was working towards their licensure i'm not gonna lie to be honest with you i was surprised three of them were even licensed i was surprised they, that any of them were i'm glad you said that uh i'm not surprised but what I, i'm glad that this report comes out with stuff like this because there's so there was so much misinformation. I mean, before this report came out, first of all, I think one thing this report should certainly do is discredit anybody who was previously saying that these cases were quote unquote trash, or that these women were all uh, in it for the money, or that all of the women went into massage massage them again. All of these women were prostitutes. This this I mean, regardless, let's just talk about the four that are in this case. But yeah, the four that are in this case, three of them are legitimate licensed women. That does not surprise me at all, because when you have 24 accusations, you're going to get a hint that are absolutely legitimate. Yeah. And, and, and I guess what my point, too, was that I was surprised they were licensed because based on the the described predatory behavior, I was surprised he went after qualified people that was that you know was kind of my point was i see what you're saying from from the trash side of it i was actually surprised because it seemed like in a lot of the situations he set them up to not be credible and by visiting um licensed they were more credible so they had you know what it, i i guess it's riskier on his part He's yes saying, it's i mean it's not yeah it's just not it, it makes it's not smart that's yeah that's what that's yeah that's exactly what i was yeah so um okay so he would follow the his instagram comment uh contact because that's where he would contact them through at least in this these cases uh with texts or calls before each set session to make sure that the therapists were comfortable massaging certain areas of his body particularly his lower back glutes abs and groin area which she puts in quote in um parentheses, his focus points. Um, and, and I know what people are going to say. They're going to be like, well, he warned them. No, no. You, you, I was in the military for several years. Those areas get painful. Uh, but it can be a situation where some people are uncomfortable with massaging your lower legs or your she, upper she legs. Does, she goes into all this in her findings. She lays that out. Yeah, that's, well. that, that's, you're right. You're right. Let's, we'll, we'll just go, go because you're right. We got to get down to that. Um, so the, it was also described that he brought a medium slash small towel or a Gatorade towel uh, the way. Um, so the NFL characterized his behavior as sexual behavior, and there is no allegation that Mr. Watson exerted any any force against any of the therapists. And that that is from the NFL's findings, and that is the end of where she of my thoughts on on the highlights, if you want to call them, whatever you want to call them. So she gets into the findings. And as we talked about, um, there was the three points, um, sexual assault, genuine danger to uh, the well-being of another person, and conduct that undermines the NFL, basically makes the NFL look bad, which is in most cases what people are actually found that, that violate the policy. That is usually why the NFL goes after them and what they go after them based on. Because right. let's be honest, that's all they care that's about. That's all they care about. That's all they care about. Yep. Because it affects the green, right? Okay. So like you said, we'll go more deeply into this first one, uh, the conduct that qualifies as sexual assault, because it is, it truly is the most important one. So she notes here that conduct of, in quote, sexual assault is not defined in the CBA, the policy, or the report that they provided. 
on behalf of the NFL, one of its investigators defined the term at the hearing. So at this hearing is when they defined what sexual assault was as it relates to the code of conduct as un, excuse me, quote, unwanted sexual conduct with another person, end quote. Pretty Not sexual contact, right? Unwanted sexual contact. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, unwanted sexual contact with another person. Um, so she then later goes down and says, "I am bound to accept the NFL's def definition of sexual assault. Therefore, it is the NFL's burden to prove that it is more likely true than not that one, Mr. Watson intended to cause contact with his penis, and number two." He did so for a sexual purpose, and then three, he knew that contact was unwarranted. And so, by the way, a couple, a couple of things. First hmm? of all, that definition, the way Sue Robinson framing it as, oh, willy nilly, NFL, you know, defining at the hearing. That's not a that's not an uncommon definition of assault. I mean, that okay. is actually sort of the stereotypical what's the definition of assault unwanted contact what's the definition of sexual assault unwanted sexual contact and then her three elements of it are also pretty standard so i don't not, so far nothing here is nothing striking me as that's their definition no this is normal that's a fine good. everything fine here yeah okay good because some people have said it wasn't I've seen that on the internet that 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 kind of how you said, you know, this is is normal. A lot of people are trying to act like it isn't. So it's it's important, I think, to to get the context for that. OK, so um, Judge Robinson goes on to say, in all four cases, the therapists were willing to go forward with the massage. However, none of the therapists were willing to offer him massage th services again. This is important because what keeps getting brought up is, well, all of them saw him again. No, maybe some, maybe, I don't know. I, Cause I don't, I don't know the specifics of every allegation. There's, there's, uh, yeah. Okay. So, but, but isn't that, isn't that horrifying that I made the statement? I don't know, don't know the specifics of every allegation. No, exactly. I mean, you should, you should, everybody should be qualifying it that way because none of yeah. us do, but nobody wants to do that. I, my point is that the sheer number should be horrifying that I have to make a statement like that because of the number. Yes, that's true too. Yeah. Okay. So this, this is where I think it gets really interesting in regards to like the, the towel, right? Like, cause that's one, one, one of the biggest pieces of evidence. Um, Judge Robinson writes, there should be no dispute that a medium or small size towel will more likely slip off a body than a sheet, leaving a client exposed. This is, I think really important because it, it is part of the burden of proof of providing the burden of proof that, that he knew that this could happen, that he was aware that he could be exposed in, 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 in can be thought as a circumstantial situation of it being premeditated of, of, you know, that sort of thing that, that he knew. I mean, you know, a small towel as opposed to a sheet is more likely to expose you I mean, it's, I don't know. That just feels like it's common sense, but I think that is where you start looking at it. Especially when you combine it with the fact that um, the, the evidence that we heard outside of this report that we're reading was that Deshaun Watson was basically very tied to bring this towel. It's <laughs> not like, oh, in these four situations, coincidentally, uh, uh, he used a small towel. It was like he would bring it from his home. And yep. so you, sort of like the, the cumulative effect of that speaks volumes. Yeah, especially because like at first, when I think when it first got reported, I was like, why does it matter that he brought a towel? Because at first it was just reported, like when it was leaked, that it was just a towel. He brought it, right. right. And you're like, oh, who cares? He brought his own towel. Now, no, he brought his own hand towel. His towel looked like this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's the towel that you dry your dishes with. Like, I mean, that's what, maybe that's even bigger than the towel he had. Um, okay. Importantly, much of the alleged conduct is not in and of itself challenged as wrongful. The use of Instagram to advertise a business or engage in a business, for instance, that's commonplace. There is evidence in the record that Mr. Watson's focus points of the lower back, glutes, abs, and groin area are legitimate focus areas for professional athletes. So as you have pointed out that we just discussed a little bit earlier, there is some merit when Watson says, oh, that's common for me to 
to do that. So she is acknowledging, yes, those areas being touched, it's not totally uncommon, but, you know, yeah, when you I, couple I, it with everything else. I think what she's saying here is that any any one of these facts by themselves in a vacuum might be completely innocent. But by, when you look at the totality of the circumstances, combined with the fact that it's four, four cases, uh, it, it's sort of, you can find by a preponderance of the evidence what she found. That's, it, it, yes. I like the way you put that because I think that that makes me kind of looking at it better understand it as well that yeah all of these things may be fine on their own not together not four times right and, and not only that but it's, it's crucial to remember even when we when we look at it in the cumulative effect we're not saying we and you're not supposed to have to say hmm. that we are 1000 percent certain he did this let's execute him for it it's preponderance of the evidence it's 51 percent is it more what's more likely that based on these facts we know what he was trying to do or that based on these facts oh he he's an, is he as innocent as you are it, it's it's if you can if you read this and you think yeah i don't know what's more likely then i think you have your head in the sand yeah yeah I, and, and i'll admit that i compartmentalized all of this and tried to um go from just the football standpoint and just talk about that because I, I I won't lie to you. I didn't know how to process it. I didn't know how to handle it from a fan standpoint, like not even talking about the commentary side of it, the articles or the podcast, things like that. I didn't know how, but once you get this out and you're looking at this and you're, and you're realizing this is an impartial judge, this is not Watson telling you this, this is not the NFL. This is a judge looking at everything and telling you these things. And it's just kind of like, yeah, and, and we're going to get to this because people are. I think people are going to argue, well, if all of this is true, if all of this is so damning, why isn't it that he ever got indicted? And I think what you just said was important. We're talking about preponderance of evidence here as in 51%, which I think definitively 51% is easily proven in my mind now reading this stuff. Uh, and, and there's more evidence. There's more stuff out there in the details of what she's referring to. We don't know all of the specifics, but in the criminal situation, they may not be believe they're able to do beyond a reasonable doubt. But they, you know, that's not what we're arguing here. And, and Judge Robinson goes into that. Yeah, I would say that just for clarity purposes, it is important to note that the grand jury is a probable cause standard, which is actually lower than the preponderance of the evidence standard. But I want to make clear, uh, and I've emphasized this a billion times, anytime somebody wants to talk about the grand jury, in Texas, you don't need a grand jury to indict misdemeanors. You can directly indict misdemeanors. These were charged as misdemeanors, but the prosecutors still brought them to a grand jury. Why would they do that? I, I was a former prosecutor. I can promise you that if I had a case that I wanted to indict, and I have the option of direct indictment or bring it to a grand jury. I'm not going to spend hours prepping a case for a grand jury when I can directly indict. Just do it. Unless I wanted to demonstrate something to you know society or the media or whatever and not actually indict the case. And so the fact that they went to the grand jury for these misdemeanor indictments and didn't just directly indict, as soon as I found that information out, it, it would, would have been obvious that they don't want an indictment here. They want it to look like they want an indictment. And, and the reason why... That's what I was going to ask. Be, it's because of what you said. Exactly. It's not. I'm not saying they're corrupt. I'm not saying they're evil. I'm not saying they're in bed with Deshaun Watson. I'm saying they probably looked at the case and thought, we will never get a, pro a, a, a beyond a reasonable doubt conviction. So why are we going to waste our time with an indictment? Let's just, let's toss the case basically. Exactly. Do you think, do you think too, that in that situation, when you go to toss the case that they, that they were either aware it was going to happen or likely to happen that civil cases would follow? Do you think that mattered at all? That civil settlements would follow or that more civil cases would come? That that if they um that if they don't indict that either more set or settlements would come or more cases or something was going to come to still impose some form of justice. No, I don't think I mean 
honestly, as bad as it sounds, you know, when, when I was when I'm thinking about my day to day life as a prosecutor, I'm just trying to get my cases off my off my desk. You know, it's like yeah. I'm thinking about. Well, he's got some pending civil cases here, so he's gonna. We're gonna get some justice. I'm just thinking, can we get a conviction or not? Do I think this case is trash or not? And I had, I had cases that I, I knew we could get a conviction on, but I hated the case, and so I didn't like. I, I didn't put that much work into it, and it, it wasn't thought of like, well, there could be some justice some other way. My only thought was, this case sucks, and I have a hundred others I have to worry about, so I'm not gonna pay attention to this. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so she will go on. Um, Mr. Watson has not testified that he had erections and inadvertently touched the therapist here. Instead, he has categorically denied the allegations against him, including that he ever developed an erection during a massage. So, like, I, I find that just, it's important to know that that is what he has fired. Because some people will say that they think he went in there to, that he did intend to go in there for sex and that some of them were consensual, which are the ones that didn't sue, and then some of them went non-consensual, but that doesn't really line up with what he claims happened, which is, I always thought was weird because I thought his defense was going to be consensual sex. Like, I thought that that was ultimately what he was going to say. And I, and I think after looking at, and I, I was saying this from the beginning, and I, I trust me, I've been wrong about a lot of things, so I'm not patting myself in the back too much. But this is one of the things I was saying from the beginning was he, he he's way better off just leaning into the defense of yeah, it was absolutely for sex and it was always consensual because yeah. based on the defense he was giving, the inconsistency of it, and based on I kept saying this and people kept saying there's no evidence, there's no evidence, there's a lot of evidence here. You have bringing towels soliciting women off Instagram that you don't know their qualifications, claiming you don't know that you don't, you can't say whether or not they're attractive or not. And yet you are then saying you don't know what their qualifications are. Did you ever use a man? No, I only use attractive young women, but I don't know if they're attractive. It's so easy with all of these facts and this evidence to find by a preponderance of the evidence that this stuff happened. Mm -hmm. And so if you're going to find that if in this situation, imagine if, Sue Robinson had to deal with the additional fact that Deshaun Watson says, yes, all of this happened. I brought my towels. I got an erection. I had, I had orgasms, but it was consensual. Now we're in the world of Sue Robinson's probably going, well, I don't know. I mean, yeah. what's the preponderance of the evidence? It's, it's just a he said, she said. He says it's consensual. She, she says no. When Deshaun Watson says, Oh, that wasn't even my intent. Oh, no, it was all normal. That's when you add in, oh, you're lying. Now I have preponderance of the evidence. Yeah. That's so vastly different just based on that simple fact. That, you know, that simple, yeah, just fact. Okay. Um, so she would later say that this lends to support to my conclusion that it is more probable than not that he ha did have erections and that his erect penis conduct contacted the therapist as claimed by them. Again, this is where we're getting at. More probable than not. That is what she is going. That is what preponderance of the evidence. That is what the standard that they are trying to trying to do. Okay, I will go. I'm going to slide down here a little bit more. I got just a couple more points on this one. Um, I find this sufficient circumstantial evidence to support the NFL's contention, not only that contact occurred, but that Mr. Watson was aware of the con that contact would probably occur, uh, obviously by asking for the areas plus the uh, towel, um, you know, the situation, the private situation. And that Mr. Watson had a sexual purpose, not just a therapeutic purpose in making these arrangements with these particular therapists. Given that none of these therapists accepted his invitations to engage, engage in further therapy sessions, I find the evidence sufficient to demonstrate that Watson knew or he should have known. That's really important there. The should have known that any contact between his penis and the therapist was unwanted. And then the last final point that wraps it up, and this is the damning one to me. This is the one that I read and I was just like, because I said, and most people said, we wanted to get as many facts, let it play out, find out how this was going to go, not just from people on the internet, not things being leaked from each side, but what a judge 
what a situation like this would occur. This final thing, I therefore find that the NFL is the top of page nine. You can read it yourself. I therefore find that the NFL has carried in burden to prove by a preponderance of evidence that Mr. Watson engaged in sexual assault. Keep that in mind. She is straight up telling you, I believe he engaged in sexual assault, not indecent exposure, not anything. No, not sexual misconduct, sexual assault against the four therapists identified in the report. He has violated the policy in this regard. Right. And, um, I think like, you know, there was, I, I just hope that people can get better at sifting through and finding the obvious facts because there was somebody who I kid you not tweeted, uh, not being sarcastic. They said, what are you all talking about? Uh, Sue Robinson said that she, he, he hasn't been uh, found guilty of any sexual assault. It's in black and white letters. Like, you just, by a preponderance of the evidence, Mr. Watson, Watson engaged in sexual assault. End of story. That's the finding. Black and, and white. The, and, and I've seen other things, people talking about this. There's not an issue of evidence. Anybody who's saying, oh, the punishment was light because of lack of evidence. No. As soon as you make a finding of fact of sexual assault occurring, evidence is no longer an issue. It has been found. It, it, it's as strong as if she found a video of it and in fact she goes on later to discuss or, or i'm sorry she she discusses the ray rice issue i went back and read a previous mm -hmm. opinion on ray rice where the judge said as much it doesn't matter if you have a video of it or if someone tells you about it you either make it you make a conclusion or you don't if you conclude that this occurred that's it now the only question is what's the punishment for it so this is we've, we've gone a little bit more in depth in some of this stuff and i know it's getting late so i don't want to so we're going to jump to the disciplinary determination because as blake has talked about here that parts two and three don't really matter after part one is proven and and, and i agree obviously they matter he you know the first the second one especially which which was conduct that poses a genuine danger to the safety and the well-being of another person. So I will give you read the part to where she says, I find that the NFL has carried its bur its burden to prove by preponderance of the evidence that Mr. Watson's conduct posed a genuine danger to the safety and the well-being of another person. So that part at least is important that they again, she agrees. She then agrees with the third part, which is more about the the def the you know, making the NFL look bad and, you know, not many people. That's not important, in my opinion, in the grand scheme of things about whether the NFL looks bad. So she goes on to talk about in the discipline, disciplinary determination. This is where it gets interesting. And I'll ask you this because I spoke with a friend of mine on Twitter who has recently uh, graduated from law school. And I, I just find that part's relevant, in my opinion, just because, because of what is said. But let me let me go bring this back up so that I can um, make sure I say what she said uh, correctly, because this is where I think it gets interesting about the ruling and why she thinks that there will not be an appeal. So I asked her that based on the the writing in this disciplinary section that. Is Judge Sue Robinson trying to say that, yes, he violated the policy, but the policy is so vague and stupidly written that this is literally all she can do based on the policy and how it reads and legal precedent? So I pose that question. She said, yes, I think that's exactly what she's getting at. However, the precedent can also be set by Goodell um, a, handing down a lengthy sentence on an appeal, which she said she doesn't think he will do. Given the two avenues, it's probably in the best interest of the NFL to just amend the CBA. So essentially, which I asked her, and, and this is like a very broad generalization, and we can go more into some parts of it if, you, if you'd like to, that essentially the reason after she found him guilty of sexual assault, that based on the way this thing is written, six was what all she could do and that it's on the NFL. Do you agree with that? I absolutely, so this is when it gets messy. I absolutely yep. agree that that is what Sue Robinson is saying. However, I would, uh, as an analogy, I would say it's the equivalent of like a, a bunch of five-year-olds asking a grown-up, help us build a sandcastle. And the grown-up comes in with rulers 
and uh, blueprints and an architecture book. And it's like, okay, well, if you guys want to make this sandcastle this long, you have to make it this wide because other the kids are just going to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We want to build a fucking sandcastle, okay? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, when I read this opinion and I read this, it almost makes me nauseous because Sue Robinson is trying to make this process a legitimate legal presidential process and the nfl is not that that is not what the nfl has ever been or wants to be and she's coming in here going oh you guys don't have precedent for she's talking about precedent she's talking about like letters of the law she's talking about um uh, uh, principles of of notice and it's just like that has nothing – the NFL doesn't operate that way. She, as an example, she uses the Ray Rice situation, and she says that, um, oh, well, see, this is exactly what happened in Ray Rice situation. The NFL suspended him uh, for longer. They suspended him indefinitely, which was longer than the, than the CBA allowed for. The CBA only allowed for ten, two games. And when that went to the arbitrator, the arbitrator said the same thing. Oh, this is longer. We need to revoke it. That's not what happened. In the Ray Rice situation, the reason why the arbitrator said you can't impose the suspension is because they first imposed two games. A video came out. Then they imposed an indefinite and the arbitrator, I read the opinion today, the arbitrator said, you didn't learn any new evidence. Mm. You just gave him a different suspension for longer only because of the backlash. Yep. That's completely arbitrary. And and, that, and I, I know that was the key issue because they went back and forth with, did Ray Rice change his story? The NFL claimed, oh, no, he, he lied to us about what happened. The arbitrator said, he didn't lie. I read everything Ray Rice told you. He told you exactly what he did. You gave him two games. When the video came out, you gave him an indefinite. That's arbitrary. You're just changing it for no reason. They, she didn't overturn that suspension because there was no precedent for an indefinite suspension. Is there a precedent for hitting a guy over the head with a helmet in the Steelers game and getting indefinite suspension? I don't think so. Was anybody talking about precedent when that happened? No, because that's not how... Last point of, of my frustration here. In this very opinion, Sue Robinson acknowledges that this is not a real system. When she says... The NFL's definition of sexual assault was told to me at the hearing. And because the NFL is God, I'm just going to accept it. So in one part of the opinion, she's basically saying, yeah, this is a kangaroo court. The NFL makes up rules as they go along, and I must accept it. And then later on in the ruling says, oh, no, I'm going to apply rules of precedent. I'm going to apply rules of notice. And because this is not, you know, there's no, it's not written down anywhere, I can't impose it. Well, where was the definition of sexual assault written down, Sue? But you accepted that. It just doesn't make any sense to me. It's completely contradictory. I don't understand. See, you know, and that's, I never even, I, the point of, hey, this, the difference between things being written down, not being written down, I never, because when I, when I read, when I read this, and I looked at it, I was like, okay, the only reason six came up. That was the decision. The only reason was because of the way the policy was laid out and then, of course, precedent. And I wonder, too, like, although in my opinion, she shouldn't be factoring this in. But I wonder if, because I know the NFL will fact, when the NFL goes to make this appeal, they're going to factor in getting sued which a lot of people believe that they will get sued. And I've seen, I would say probably the majority believe that the NFL would win, that they would not lose that, you know, whatever, that they would eventually, eventually, whenever it played out, they would win the case, but they would potentially avoid that just because of the money and the PR and the potential of an injunction being filed. And if an injunction gets filed and Watson's on the field for week one, that's going to be a problem. It's, it would be, it would be a massive problem for the NFL. And so that they may, you know, chicken out or however you want to put it to back away from that possibility by not challenging that. And it almost felt like to me that reading this and then hearing you, especially now I'm wrapping this up together, that Sue Robinson was almost factoring that in. Like she was factoring the fact that if she didn't use precedents, that the NFLPA was going to sue on precedence if it went, because that was part of their argument, right? 
like their argument was they were going to sue if you did a year because you never did anything to the owners. Like not because he was innocent, but because precedent dictated that, well, the policy says these guys are held to a higher standard, but you hold them to no standard whatsoever when it comes to the owners. And it almost felt like to me that she was aware like, oh, and so what she tried to do was find middle ground. Like, like Watson wanted zero, right? But it was reported he would accept like four to eight. And the NFL wanted indefinite of at least a year. And then we heard from Gra uh, Dan Graziano talked about this yesterday that it was 12, right? That they were, they were willing to go down to 12 and a massive fine. And it feels like she almost threw a dart down the middle and said, hey, you... Like, cause this reads to me, like she thinks he's a sicko that Watson is a sicko, a problem. He, ha he has a major problem. He's a bad person. She, she, it almost reads to me. Like she said, you, you got a problem, fix yourself. And, and I'll get into that as we wrap this thing up about what she said about some of the other stuff, you know, like that she interestingly added to the end that the, that the, she even admits the code of conduct doesn't have any power to enforce, but you're a sicko be better. And then looks at the NFL and says, "Fix your policy." And then threw a dart down the middle, and that's where she came. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm, a, I, I think it was, I think it was more about what you first said, which is that she literally just said, "Well, what does the what what's the precedent say you you give for these types of conduct uh, or this type of conduct? Six games? That's what I'm giving. Six games." And, but I agree with you completely, which is that she basically is saying, "I don't even have the right to do anything else." I think she, I think if there was a if there was a line in the CBA that said, uh, if if it's found that a player uh, commits a violation of the per, uh, personal conduct policy, quote unquote, egregiously and continuously, we can impose anything up to a five year suspension. If that was in the CBA, I think Sue Robinson would have given Deshaun would have given Deshaun Watson a year at, at least. She might have given him an indefinite. Uh, of at least a year. I don't know because. Uh, I, 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 she finds she finds that he engaged in sexual assault, and she finds, as you said later on, she says it's the most egregious pattern she's ever seen. So, yeah, I don't think she wanted to give six games, but in her mind, she felt constricted for reasons I don't understand to give six games. See, and that's what's just so weird is like I get the policy side of it, but it's like. <sighs> It's like what you said, like it, you straight up said that it's the most egregious thing you've ever done, you've ever seen. You're a federal judge. And, I, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think she dealt with uh, these types of crimes primarily over her career. So I had read that somewhere. So it's not necessarily that she's seen a ton of these, but she's still a judge. Yeah, it's like you're still a judge. So you've talked to other judges and you know about patterns. So if it's the most egregious thing you have ever seen in all of these years, then it's probably pretty bad. Well, I think she was saying it's the most egregious thing the NFL's ever seen oh. because that's what was in their investigation. Okay. That yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. That's my bad. Okay, let's wrap this thing up. We're at 40 to 45 minutes. I said, well, we're going to do this daily short video. Me and Blake will sit down and talk about this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to um, – one thing that I thought was interesting because she refers to him as a first offender with an excellent reputation in his community prior to these events, Yeah, which I think is important to put in there. But at the same time, based on everything else I just read, I don't care. Um, yeah, but those are, that's a mitigating factor. She, it's just typical sentencing stuff. Once you get into the sentencing, you first, you look at what the, what the statute says, statute in this case, what the rule says, and then you add aggravating or mitigating factors. Fair enough. So then she goes and says, he's here by sentence six games. Then she adds down here that um, recognizing that the only discipline mentioned in the CBA is a fine or suspension. I nevertheless believe it appropriate for Mr. Watson to limit his massage therapy to club directed sessions, club approved therapists for the duration of his career. And so impose the mandate as a condition as a condition for to his reinstatement. Uh, Mr. Watson is to have no adverse involvement with law enforcement and must not commit any violence any additional violations of the policy, which I think is important because it's almost she she puts in there that he is a first time offender. So no matter what, another violation of the policy becomes a multi, you know, a multiple offender. Although the amount of times in which he engaged in conduct, I don't know if I 
personally think you I can fully call him a first time offender. So this is this is my overall on everything, and then I'll and then you give me your three takeaways, and we'll get your three biggest takeaways, and we'll get out of this. No matter if the NFL appeals this or not, Watson is going to be on the field at some point. Personally, I think he'll play this year. I don't know. I don't know how long. I kind of I'm I'm I am very firmly on the fence. I have no idea if I think the NFL will appeal or not. I really don't. Because I've seen I've heard plenty of people say they think you they will, and plenty that say they think they won't. And a lot of the people that say that have some kind of narrative that they're driving. So I don't even know if you can, you know, listen to what they're saying uh objectively. He's gonna be on the field at some point. And the only way in my mind I can make peace with this is if I know from this point on he's a different person, right? Like this person, the stuff that I read here, I'm embarrassed that I haven't been more vocal against the behavior and the allegations. And I understand that I wanted to take an objective view as a sports journalist, as a person, as a fan, and I wanted to just look at the football. When you read it like this, you you definitively say he committed sexual assault. There's just no way to bend that. You can't twist it. You can't spin it. You can't do it. He committed sexual assault. Now, it looks like the policy... And the way the NFL has handled business in the in the end is probably going to let him off light. Six games is not enough. I will tell you right now, I do not believe, based on what I have read here in these findings, that six games is enough. He'll be on the field at some point. I just pray that Kevin Stefanski said something today along the lines of on and off the field. I expect him to make the right decisions on and off the field going forward. And I just pray that that is too true. I pray that he is remorseful for his actions and that the victims can find peace. Yeah, well said. Um, I, I would just say that overall with this opinion, I, I, my, my biggest takeaways is first, um, this is a lot more of a kangaroo court and a lot more of a kangaroo situation than I thought it was. Sue Robinson, I, I'm not as impressed as I thought I would be. Um, I just, I mean, even and this is just me being nitpicky based on my experience drafting opinions like this. I mean, even at the very end where she's basically just like six games and, uh, oh yeah, no, no massages outside the club. Like what, it, what are you doing that you're just like telling us she didn't, she say that she doesn't have the ability yeah. to do that. Does, yeah. I mean, I, I think stuff like that is just like sort of laughable and it, and they're, and they're in bullet points. I don't know. I just find this kind of gross, honestly. Um, a, sec, a second takeaway is uh, I noticed this when they were tweeting uh, last night about this uh, decision coming out today, and I noticed it, the statement and the word and the opinion. It specifically says on page um, two, this is in respect to whether or not the NFL will appeal. Um, the disciplinary officer is responsible for conducting effort injury hearings issues issuing binding findings of fact and determining the discipline that quote should be imposed. They, they used the tweet lot Ian Rappaport, I think, Justina Anderson, I think she after all said, um, Sue Robinson's going to state what she thinks what the suspension should be. That's not the same thing as saying what it will be, etc. The way they're framing it in the CBA, the way that these reporters have been framing it, it sounds like the NFL has made very clear to people this is a suggestion. Mm-hmm. Basically, we're basically saying, hey, Sue, give us your suggestion as to what we should do, and then we'll decide if we're happy with it. Based on that, I'm with you. To me, it's a crapshoot if they appeal. It wouldn't surprise you if they do. It wouldn't surprise you if they don't. I have no idea. Um, my last takeaway would just be Deshaun Watson committed sexual assault. If this had happened in 2019 for this new CBA, Deshaun Watson would have been suspended, suspended for a year. I have no question about that. Um, I, I've, I just, I don't. We've never seen a situation like this. She admits in the opinion we've never seen a situation like this. And uh, he got six games from an individual who said basically my hands are tied. If this was before when Roger Goodell just did whatever he wanted, Roger Goodell's not going to say my hands are tied. I think he would have given him a year. Uh, a year. 
I think, I think, I think if, if it was before, I think he would have immediately been like indefinite. We'll revisit it later. Like, cause do you remember like the way he did rule Miles Garrett? Like we briefly yeah. talked about it. It was an indefinite suspension of at least the rest of the year and the playoffs. They made the point just in case the like the like that team was going to make the playoffs but but j- they they made that point that like hey and if something wild happens you guys are in the playoffs no you're not getting back in on the technicality we'll revisit it then you can come and you can talk to me and we can have that situation and of course they and, and I think Miles truly understood what he had done was wrong um the browns released a weird statement today from Jimmy and D Haslam that talked about Deshaun being remorseful, which I, I've not seen him be. Maybe he is in private. He hasn't done it publicly, though. Uh, like in any way. And I get it. People will say, well, he can't because of the cases. Well, now you're down to one case. There is only one pending case. He settled three of the remaining four cases. And apparently the news broke at 1 a.m. this morning, which was weird, but to, in my opinion. But it, it like, you've, if he, at some point when he plays football at some point in a way we're going to have to move past the fact that he didn't get justified punishment because at a certain point it's going to be too far gone right like once the suspension is there and it's played out and he's back on the field there's really nothing we can do like you said we're talking about the Ray Rice situation because there's not new evidence we can't we can't double jeopardy him so to speak um, in this situation without a new evidence or a new case or whatever. Right, right. Uh, but we're going to move past. I, I just pray that with all of this going on, that, that maybe somehow he sits down has a conversation with miles Garrett and he goes that route. Like I, I, it, it, cause it's all I can do, man. I think it's, I think it's all we can do it, is just hope that he does. He is remorseful. Hope that, he hoped that whatever the settlement was hurts him and helps the victims. I mean, I do think maybe I'm being naive, but I don't, I don't think he would do anything like this ever again, because this has, I mean, this has nearly ruined his life. That, yep. In practice, I guess it really hasn't harmed him that much at all, other than his pocketbook. Yeah. Uh, slightly, but I don't, I mean, I, I'm optimistic. Um, it, it's you know we're talking about misdemeanor levels of, of assault. This isn't this isn't somebody that I would feel uncomfortable being in the same room with. Uh, it's not, honestly, it's not somebody I would feel uncomfortable having my girlfriend in the same room with. If she was giving him a, a massage, yeah, I would. But if if my girlfriend called me and said I'm in an elevator with the Sean Watson, I'm, I'm not going to be get out of there right now. Yeah. He's like a relatively normal guy outside of these situations that he's putting people in. Um, and so I agree. I just, I mean, I hope for the best. Well, Blake, I said, hey, sit down with me and like for like 20 minutes. You sat down with me um, in your busy schedule for about an hour. I really, really appreciate you taking this time. I hope everybody that sees this video, hit that like, hit that subscribe, follow Blake at Blake Weiner Law on Twitter. Uh, I said this about you last time when you appeared on the podcast. I truly believe all the advice, all the words, everything that you tell me is unbiased and legit because you told me last time, you told me this time, stuff that from a fan, I didn't want to hear, which tells me that the the information I'm getting from you is the information you would give anybody in any situation. So I appreciate the, the impartial impartialness i was gonna say impartiality and i was like i don't know if that's a word I think that's impartiality. It, it, oh yeah here we go all right i'm learning words and so i really appreciate that and i appreciate your time and um and you know i'm sure we'll talk soon yeah man i, I really appreciate it fun thanks thanks man hey guys we'll talk to you guys soon